So quick, I can sit down, but I still have a question for her. Okay. And, and this is sort of like a, a, a moronic question from a, from, uh, it'll be clear that I'm, you know, not completely trained as a geneticist. The, the de novo idea, um, do you have any sense at all where that comes from? Uh, you know, you sort of say, say, well, that's evolution. It's just evolution hard at work, but it looks like this sort of, there's a particular predilection for those particular uh, genes that, that will result in congenital heart disease, given how common congenital heart disease is. Uh, and is there a background rate of variation in those genes that are, are or are not associated with, with various kinds of heart disease that we would call congenital or we might not even call congenital? Uh, things like atrial fibrillation. Um, well, Dan, I'm not 100% unsure of your question. So Neither am I. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the de novo rate um, uh, is constructed from whole genome sequences. Daly's group has really spearheaded this, and others have as well. Um, and, and that is independent of phenotype and independent of anything other than across large numbers of databases, and 1,000 genomes being one of them, how likely do we see a change at that particular nucleotide? And then the question becomes, are any genes more susceptible and are more mutable? And the answer is yes. Um, for example, um, the olfactory receptor, I think most people know, is extraordinarily mutable. And as best we know, the phenotypes associated with it are trivial. Um, and, and so there are genes that we have to recognize are mutable, and I suspect Dan is going to talk about this, and those are the ones we have to, in particular, be, if you will, discounting about whether variants found there are pathogenic. But similarly, there are other genes that are constrained and are less mutable, probably because if they are mutated, they are devastating to the organism. Um, and it's not surprising to me that we found these very essential genes in this cohort because, as I tried to tell you from my 30-second clinical synopsis of cardiac progress over the past 50 years, these kids all died in years gone by. And if they didn't die, they, didn't, they were told not to reproduce. So there was no enrichment in the community's genome of these variants. Um, so they had to be de novo. And, and if they do reproduce? Well, that's the big question. That's the real big question. Uh, when this cohort in 2010 is 17 years of age, what happens next? And that's why I think interpretation is very important um, of what their children are at risk for. So are you going to put this in their electronic medical record? <laughs> Well, these were research exomes, so um, no, but oh, I will tell you the PCGC has struggled with um, not only these findings, but I think um, equally so, um, not surprisingly, incidental findings. And um, I think that we are, I know that we are committed to finding a way for really returning very important incidental findings, some of which um, are present, would cause disease in, in infancy and childhood, so. Mark? So this is uh, uh, an extension of what uh, Dan was uh, asking, and I think it, it uh, reflects another way that we could aggregate data that would be of use, uh, and that is, um, you know, what genes are, are more important to look out for based on their sensitivity. And, and we've done this in ClinGen already uh, through a process called the dosage sensitivity map where we're looking grossly to say, is there tolerance of haplo or triplo insufficient, uh, sufficiency, and does that have um, uh, disorders associated with it? But um, Joseph Shea, um, I think at UCSF or Stanford, um, has also been doing some very interesting work looking at mutation depletion, comparing number of synonymous variants out of uh, exome collections uh, to missense variants. And, and what you'll find is that in many genes, there's really no significant difference between the number of synonymous variants and the number of missense variants. But in other genes, there uh, appears to be an extreme intolerance for missense variation compared to synonymous variation, which gives you at least some insight, perhaps, that these genes are more important and less tolerant. Therefore, a, a signal in one of those genes 
may have to be paid attention to much more so than in ones where there's not. I mean, we right at the present time, we don't have a catalog across all human genes of that type of mutation depletion analysis. And so that would be um, something that would be uh, worthwhile. The second thing I'll just say is that um, I, I would add one bullet to your list of things that would um, uh, cause um, uh, one to think of something as being very um, uh, important in diagnostic, and that is occasionally there are single variants uh, that are recurrent that cause exactly the same phenotype. And uh, even very small numbers of patients, uh, if you see uh, the exact same variant recurring with the exact same phenotype, that could indicate something uh, important mechanistically where the rest of the gene may not in fact have anything to do with that, but there's something about that specific variant that's important to pay attention to. And so flagging those of which there are a handful of examples would also be very important. Dan? Just uh, on the, the point of uh, looking for genes that have that inc incredible depletion of variation, so I'll, I'll talk about this again this afternoon. We, we can actually find these genes empirically by looking for genes that are lacking variation in the general population in very large-scale databases like EXARC. And so if we just focus on loss of function variants, for instance, we can zoom in on a set of between 2,500 to 3,000 genes that are almost completely absent of loss of function variants in normal individuals. And that turns out to be a set of genes that's enormously enriched for de novo mutations in the types of diseases that Cricket just talked about, as well as autism, intellectual disability, and others. But 80% of those genes, we actually don't know what their function is. So they're clearly very important. We just, we just don't know what they are. Could I just add that there's a, a it's okay. Uh, um, another nuance is it's not necessarily loss of function in the whole gene. Um, gene domains turn out to be very, very important, and that's just emerging. Um, and is it? Remarkable to me um, for someone who has lived most of her life in adult onset cardiac diseases, we know that you can have loss of function mutations in the most common cause of cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy and predilection to heart failure. Uh, and it occurs, these loss of function can occur across the huge molecule titan. The ones that are clustered in an A band domain or uh, parts of the Z disk will really increase risk of disease. Those that cluster in the I-band are found in the general population and have very little, if any, manifestations. So it's gene by gene won't be enough, and I know that um, people are working at the Broad to try and get domains. Uh, there are some simple reasons that it can account for that. It's called alternative splicing and alternative exon usage during development. Um, and so, and development meaning throughout life development. And so those are simple things, but we have to really expect more complexity and more granularity um, as we understand these more. All right, Mark's going to make a very brief yeah. remark so, and then Les is up. So the, the loss of function is great, but it's easy. I need the gain of function miss sense. That, the, that's, if we could figure out a way to somehow automatically flag gain of function, uh, that would be a huge improvement, uh, I think, also. So uh, we need both sides of that. Yeah, just to change topics a little bit, I was um, intrigued by uh, Cricket's movie of the um, the myocytes pulling the, I think they were uh, sensors together, um, and it brought to mind the issue, which I think, Daniel, we also discussed at that assessing causality workshop, which is uh, a concept which I don't think necessarily this is the right term, but this concept of the proximity of the functional assay to the actual disease process in the human is a concept that that movie reminded me of. And one could imagine, I don't know if this is true, but in that case, you could imagine that that assay is about as close as you can get to measuring a, a, a functional assay of an inotropic defect in a heart, whereas it might be a little less predictive of a 3D structural developmental defect in a heart. And we have a lot of these things where, and this is a, uh, a debate that arose uh, following that workshop with, between that workshop and uh, John, Jean Laurent Casanova, uh, where he very articulately showed that you can do N of 1 studies when you have incredibly close proximity of a functional assay to a disease process. And when you're measuring something that is nine inferential steps away from the disease process, like the number of presynaptic vesicles in a cultured neuron 
and autism, uh, you need to be very careful. And we need to, as a field, figure out how we're going to measure that inferential distance so that we can properly infer from functional data to disease. Less for Briefly, I 100% and always do agree with you. Um, I, I would say that um, that's what the beauty is of not finding an N of 1 is. It's being able to take an, a mass of, this is what cohorts teach you, that there are pathways that are perturbed. And the lesson in congenital heart disease, it's called developmental transcription gone awry. And so the proximal assay then can be a transcriptional readout, which is an appealing. It doesn't quite explain why there's a hole in your heart. But but it gets you a first step in the way. Um, and the second thing I'd add is with regard to the missense variants, these cellular assays at least, even at a proximal or very distant way, allow you to ask, is it similar to the slam dunk loss of function variant? And remarkably, we have seen very close correlation between missense variants and loss of functions some of the times and very divergent responses other the times. And at least it adds to the list of whether this is, the missense is likely to be very, uh, to be pathologic or not. Okay. Uh, I have a different, but uh, maybe naive question about the de novo mutations. So do we actually know when are they most likely happen? Are they in the parent's germline or after fertilization? Uh, if there's a systematic study about the mosaic, genetic mosaicism across general population, because because you might genotype in the blood, but you are looking at phenotype in the cardiomyocytes, and is there something missing there? Um, great questions. So we have the benefit, first time ever for cardiologists have a benefit. We get tissue from these children because of the repairs that they undergo. And somaticism, somatic mosaicism, um, we are not seeing at a tissue level, part one. Occasionally we do, but it's a very, very small proportion. Second of all, we know statistically that um, there's a very close correlation between the um, increased risk of paternal age and congenital heart malformations. And the hypothesis is that these are mutations that arise in spermatogenesis and are conveyed to the child, uh, but they are germline. Uh, and certainly, we recognize the possibility for somatic mutations. It's just not been a major component in everybody we've looked at to date. Okay, Mark has another brief response, and then Callum. Yeah, this is uh, from the exome um, uh, data. It, it looks like that maybe three to five percent of individuals that are uh, diagnosed on the basis of exomes have somatic mosaicism. Uh, probably showing a milder phenotype of a more severe um, uh, condition. So it, that may be the, at least the preliminary sense of the N uh, related to that question. So majority is still germline, right? So it's like three that, to five. Well, that is correct, yes. It's as close as we can get to saying germline. So my question is really an integral of Fleiss's question for the last two, which is, I didn't realize you had tissue from these uh, subjects, Cricket. Did you look at those, the tissues from those individuals who were genotype negative to see if they had the same transcriptional disarray as you saw in the genotype positive? Because the vast majority of your patients had no mutations in any of the genes. Sorry, correct. So if we take CNVs and we take point mutations that we predict are damaging uh, and um, arrays for structural abnormalities uh, across the genome, we're not yet at anywhere close to 50 percent of kids with congenital heart disease. So there's a lot to do. Um, we have two models, and you're right, as usual, um, in terms of what we think may be we, a missing piece. Um, when we look at the transcriptional profiling of exome negative children, or if you will, genotype negative children, um, we can see that there can be loss of function of specific uh, uh, molecules in comparison to all the other children whose tissues we also have. So they have less expression and they often have um, monoallelic expression uh, that can't be accounted for by their genome uh, DNA. So they're, they're missing heterozygosity that's present in the genome and their level of transcripts is reduced. Frankly, what I think that begs is the question that there is a regulatory mutation in the gene, in the elements around that gene, or perhaps distally, and I think that makes logical sense based on the idea that chromatin modification opens up the DNA for transcription factors to come in and activate gene transcription. Both of those 
pathways sit on cisacting or potentially transacting sequences. So that's potentially another source of mutations. We're looking, whole genome sequencing. Yeah, I'll just follow up on the, uh, quickly amend that mosaicism. You were given sort of an aggregate averaging across a number of phenotypes. Important to recognize that the biology of the disease determines that uh, in the specific, and there are some traits where you only see the variant mosaic, some where you see essentially none, others where you see an admixture, and that's telling you about the biology of that variant in development as to when it will occur. So a question for Stephen related to, to Kirk's presentation. I'm, I'm wondering, I would assume most of these children do end up in an intensive care unit. So, so Stephen, would they be included in, in your group of, of children who should have whole exome or whole genome done? Yes, definitely. And uh, this backdrop of de novo mutations being the major driver of genetic disease in a NICU environment is true irrespective of phenotype. It's clearly way out there as the leading cause of, of pathogenic or disease causative variants. So, so is it standard of care, Cricket, to, to whole genome or whole exome sequence these kids? I would assume not, but, but what, would, what would make it so, or, should, or do you think it should be standard of care at, at this stage? Well, I think um, standard of care is to get to the diagnosis. And so what's the most quick and efficient way and cost-effective way to do that? And um, if a raise will tell you that you have uh, a structural malformation that's accounting for it, you're done. I think that having, as we heard from Stephen, you know, rapid ability to move and get a rapid result from exome would be enormously productive. Has it been proven that it is the cost-effective way? Not quite yet. Not quite yet. Um, and I think the other thing is I, again, tried to drive home is that even if you find that variant, I think we have to have a nuanced interpretation of what it means to that child. Um. Oh, okay. So uh, it was a little scary for a second. I thought it was going to explode. Uh, so I had a question for Stephen and even for Gail. We, we discussed it a little bit during the intermission. You know, it was, it was really striking, you know, to see that this is a subset of patients in the NICU or the pediatric intensive care unit. Brings you back to newborn screening, you know, who should be sequenced, when they should be sequenced. Um, and then the, you know, the efficiency because, you know, when these kids are in intensive care units, they're usually already in crisis, right? So can you comment on maybe what the role of the private sector is in exome sequencing? Um, certainly there are a lot of companies out there who are taking more of a consumer-based approach um, to see if they can't, um, you know, sort of break into that market. And I was particularly struck by your diagram of where the sequencing and the diagnostics are as fact as the, the early adapters, you know, at this point. If there's a profitability margin in there, that's going to take off really quickly. So do you have a, a comment on when you think the private sector is really going to play a big role in this? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think the impediment to the private sector just jumping right in has been that reimbursement has been really troublesome. So I think clinical utility is, is clearly there, um, at least in these retrospective studies. I think that uh, cost effectiveness is starting to be shown. Again, it's retrospective analyses, but for selected cases, I think extending that to newborn screening is, is that's a whole different world. Um, and the whole uh, formatting and pretest probability issues uh, mean that, that that's a, a really a separate subject. Uh, remember, that in the NICU and PICU, we're chasing a phenotype, so we know when we're done. We know when we have a cause. Uh, for, for newborn screening, we're looking at asymptomatic individuals, uh, typically healthy individuals, um, and so we don't have any functional guidance to help us interpret our findings. So I think all of the things that I showed you in terms of this being mature, ready to go, uh, scientifically, are for that specific situation of an acutely ill kid who's believed to have a genetic cause of their, of their phenotype. Um, I am really, really concerned about direct-to-consumer um, offerings starting to, to, to uh, come up uh, you know, during pregnancy um, and also for kids. 
Um, and this is a reason I think that it behoves us as the scientific and medical community to really start to accelerate our, uh, our efforts in the area uh, because I think uh, there could be um, some tremendous disadvantages to seeing this uh, escape from the medical, from medical normalcy and become direct to consumer. That's my major fear, uh, is that it is so obvious that some of these things are ripe for, for utilization. And as, as a, you know, uh, as a group, we are so slow to implement. Yeah, I guess I'll make a comment about the biochemical part of newborn screening, because I'm also a biochem clinical biochemical geneticist, don't run a lab. But um, I think it's really important to be doing research on newborn screening, whole exome, whole genome. But in terms of making diagnoses, we've had 15 to 50 years of experience biochemically. And while we do have some biochemical data that we're not sure what to do with, and we often will go to um, sequencing there and look for pathogenic variants. It is much better than trying to look through all the missense variants you're going to get at the genomic level. So um, I think we need to look at it, but I don't think that in the short term it should replace biochemical screening. And I don't know in every state, but in Ohio we typically have a five-day turnaround um, after being done at 24 to 48 hours. So I think that should remain the gold standard for now. Yeah, how about, uh, because now um, almost all the talks in this morning is focused on how to use genomics data about diagnostics. So I want to raise a little bit more far-fetched idea about this for intervention. So especially for Steven's talk about a lot of neonatal, uh, very pathogenic mutation or Mendelian uh, disease. So uh, there could be a mechanism of fast track therapeutics for gene therapy or genome editing to really save the kids from dying or have development really serious uh, phenotype. Uh, I totally agree. I think that the moment we solve the diagnostic bottleneck, we create a whole, uh, a whole wave of new therapeutic opportunities. So these are kids who traditionally just wouldn't have been ascertained in time to create a market. Uh, so neither in terms of the numbers or the timeliness of ascertainment, uh, we're solving that bottleneck, and that will make many, many orphan disease, orphan diseases palatable uh, for therapeutic development. I think it's going to be very exciting. So I would just only add um, the half full or half empty cup. Um, for congenital heart disease and this association with NDD is that if you know a child who has one of these malformations and is at higher risk for neurocognitive um, issues, the sooner that child can get interventions. And I would suggest that if the autism spectrum community, not physicians, but the community has taught us anything, is that early interventions and consistent intervention has made a huge difference in the learning capacity of these children, their social behavioral uh, development. And so we have to look at these as, you know, potential problems with addresses that aren't even necessarily at the drug therapeutic level. So I guess we have a few more minutes to keep talking, and I have a, a question that maybe raises it up a little bit to think about um, things that we can do to make the connections between what we're seeing in the clinic and going back to um, fuel more basic research so that we can continue the dialogue in certain areas. And we heard a couple of things from people suggested about resources that would be useful, and I just wanted to ask if there were other things that anyone around the table could offer. I mean, we talked about the different assays and, and trying to figure out whether how proximal they were and how to infer from that um, relative to the different diseases. We talked about resources for genes or gene domains that were particularly um, important to look at so that if you found something in those, you would be able to learn something from going to a data resource of some kind. But are there other kinds of resources or tools 
that we should be thinking about that whether it's from cricket specific example or other examples that would be useful to develop or ways that we can try and make this conversation more efficient across the board if there's any way to do that besides just in particular disease, sort of disease by disease area. So this is completely unrealistic pie in the sky, but as I've been listening, I was thinking if we could develop some sort of a standardized approach to take, you know, all variants that are being submitted to ClinVar and run them through sort of a standardized set of functional assays, um, you know, introduce them in yeast and other model organisms and something like that, and then aggregate all the data as opposed to relying on sort of a hit and miss about did, did I find an investigator who's interested, what did they do, and then did we actually report what we found. I mean, that's, that is a huge ask in terms of resources and, uh, and capacity. But if we had a standardized assessment of variants that, you know, we could then aggregate the data, I think that would be incredible. So, so, I mean, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe take one step back and, and, and ask the question, is there a sort of a, can you define a minimal set of assays that you would use? I mean, I just sort of think about the, the genes that Cricket just talked about, think about the genes I worry about, think about the genes other people in this room worry about. I'm not, I'm not sure a single set, a single assay or a single small set of assays would be all that informative but it would be worth thinking about whether you could define a set like that to yeah, start I think with. And, I, and there are some generic uh, things that you can think about that I think we're going to hear about over the next day I or think two. The, 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 okay. the next step would be to, you know, convening thought leaders to say what would that look like and then in addition to defining that minimum set, what are the thing, what are the results from that minimum set that might promote uh, variants to, uh, to, you know, to the next level of assessment. I mean, that would be the way I would sort of conceptualize it. Well, I, I was just going to suggest, what, you know, as opposed to, to Mark's uh, suggestion of doing every variant and every, every, every functional assay, not that that was exactly what you were suggesting, is there a way of developing, you know, something through matchmaker exchange or something similar that instead of a phenomizer, you could have a functionizer and, and at least, you know, send out a query for anybody who is actively studying the function of a given variant in a, in a given gene? I mean, it seems like that would be relatively tractable that even Mark could afford to do. So human patients are the best phenotype assay we've got. And to my mind, what we need to do is constrain the space at the genetic level that might be influencing phenotype. To say background genotype influences a mutation, we get that. But which part of the background genotype? And I think that these pathway analyses at least give us a handle. So what happens? for example, in my adult field of sarcomere gene mutations. What happens when you have a pathogenic mutation in myosin and you have 75 other relatively rare variants in troponins, in C proteins, in titan, and the like? What happens in terms of that patient versus a relative or another person with a similar or better yet identical mutation and their local background genotype, not at the genome level, but at the functional level. And can we begin to think about clinical phenotypes not as an N of 1 variant, but an N of 1 clustered in, if you will, the systems biology approaches of those dust webs um, that allow you to see interactomes that might be influencing phenotype. And what I like about that strategy is that it doesn't require an assay. We've already done it. We have clinical phenotyping and we have the genetic information increasingly about genomes and exomes and hopefully we can begin to interrogate them in a clustering way that is informative of phenotype. I'm not sure if that's clear, but it's a. Yeah, I was interested for Cricket and Stephen. So, how universal do you think the environments are for other researchers to enable them to do the kind of research that you just talked about? In other words, are you in such special 
places that have access to the resources and the personnel and the special specializations in computation and genetics and access to clinical information. I mean, how unique is that? Is, is what you're talking about something that any researcher could do if they wanted to do? How, if, if the answer is to no, what are the, what do you think the, the main gaps are that we might be able to address with, say, the kinds of things Mark just talked about? So I think we'll have a completely different response to your question. Uh, my worldview is of doing research in, in order to enable a new way of practicing healthcare. Uh, and so uh, my peers are MDs and hospitals and healthcare practices. And so if we ask, are, is what we do locally extensible to other places? I think uh, some answers are yes. Uh, and some answers are no, that we need to address the, the gaps that I mentioned in terms of educating physicians, provision of additional uh, software tools for automation and for computation, uh, and process engineering to sort of shrink wrap uh, what today is a very researchy pipeline into something that's robust and, and uh, deployable by any um, hospital with their traditional um, uh, data handling capabilities. Um, so to me, research is something that we are doing to get us to that, that phase. And I think it's more implementation science and clinical trials and computational research rather than um, some of the other things. I think we're doing pretty well in terms of the 4,500 disease genes for which we know the molecular basis but there's this huge gap between that knowledge and putting that into clinics all over the country. I, I think it takes a village. <laughs> um, and I think you need computational biologists, and I think you need phenotypers, and I think you need really good clinician scientists. And right now that happens in academic healthcare centers. Um, and I think that's where this kind of research, and that's what it is. It's not clinical delivery yet. It's very close. Um, it's one of the issues on the problem. It's one of the lists on the problem list, but it's not yet a diagnosis. And, and I think it has to do with the nuances of what we see. Yes, we can all recognize a loss of function mutation. But what does that mean to that patient? And that's where I think the rubber hits the road. So to understand that is more research. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering you, but for the community-based practitioners, should they, you know, with any child with congenital heart disease do an exome? Well, not unless they're going to be willing to pass it off to someone to help them interpret it, because right now I don't think the interpretation would, would be good medicine um, in those hands. But um, is it an opportunity to expand research? Yeah, absolutely. And those kids by referral and Genome Collective, I think we'll all learn a lot. So then the real question is, do we have the bandwidth? Do people like you have the bandwidth to take on more? You know, do we need more such centers? I mean, how, how do we actually ramp this up to, to be able to deal with the scale of the problem that we face if we need these sort of specialized centers to do so? So I think specialized centers is what I'm alluding to today is really specialized disciplines in every traditional aspect of medicine. I mean, we all know about referring and referral patterns in every community into a more um, tertiary, quaternary medical institution. And if we build into that genomicists, um, I think that people will simply follow the usual clinical referral pathways, but now having this enrichment of having genome science be incorporated in terms of interpretation of the clinical presentation and course. Okay, we've got Rex, Gail, Howard, and Caitlin can have the last word. So I, I think one of the things that strikes me is that this really at some level becomes a, a big data-data data integration problem. You know, I think, uh, for example, there's a list of genes that we know what their functions are and there's a list of genes that we don't know what their functions are. Maybe we need to be focusing on the genes, uh, other things we should be doing to develop, understand the function of genes whose function is unknown because often GWAS hits and other kinds of hits fall in those genes. So that seems like, you know, one big 
program that we should think about. And then the data integration, I, as did several other people in this room. Last week I was at uh, meetings that were focused on genome sequencing programs at NHGRI. And I left that with a, with a real theme that one of the things that we have to struggle with constantly is looking under the lamppost, you know, where there's light. And so in the case of genomes, what everybody is doing when they think about a whole genome is there's not enough power in a whole genome to think about whether something is really statistically significant or not. So what they do is they figure out how to constrain it so that they're not looking through the whole genome, but only looking through part of it. And we, we've seen a couple of examples of that today, whether it was using a transcriptome to focus down the genes that are important to look at, whether it's uh, temporal expression to look down at whether where something is located. I'm sure there are a whole host of others, uh, you know, that are big projects, but if you did them, could inform all of these. So, for example, if protein X is missing, how does that affect the rest of the proteome? You know, that's, that's a, an interesting question that, you know, we should think about some at-scale ways to address. And then if we can think about all those at-scale ways to address and then think about integrating the data, then the people that have this gene mutation in some gene that they don't know anything about actually have some ways to constrain where they need to look. And I think that would go a long way. I, the, all of those are big problems, but you know, we should be thinking about those kinds of data integration of activities. Very quickly, you know, while we work towards trying to get more and more understanding of the phenotypic significance of a variant, which I think is a lot of what we're talking about, um, maybe we should also be giving some thought to the fact that we'll probably never totally understand a lot of this and that we need to also develop tools for communication and for living in the world of ambiguity. And I guess one thing worth thinking about is Somebody asked earlier about direct-to-consumer testing, and there's lots of debate about whether that's a wise thing or not, but at least from my perspective, one thing they've gotten very, very good at is clearly communicating information. And, you know, if we in our clinical world put a one one-hundredth of the effort they put into how to clearly define things and what color the screen should be and where you place things on the screen to enhance understanding, I think we'd be farther along in terms of the quality of our, our report. So I guess my point is that developing tools, apps and other things that help to communicate the inevitable ambiguity of genomic information is I think another area where effort may be placed. Yeah, I was going to say, I think there's going to have to be a lot of choice in where, which genes you invest in to find the variants. I mean, it's one thing to find the genes, but for us now, a lot of it is, is this variant in this gene pathogenic? And I've talked to someone in a little startup where they've taken every um, base and amino acid in BRCA1 and they've modified it and they've developed a yeast assay and assuming that they can show someone who knows this that the phenotype in yeast will predict pathogenicity in human. That's incredibly powerful. Um, but when you come to autism or human behavior, that's, I don't think in most cases that's just going to work. And so then you're left with mouse or other kinds of assays developing um, neural stem cell models or organoid models. Um, and I think a lot's going to have to come down to making choices. I don't think we're not going to be able to do it for everyone. Um, or we're going to have to pick the genes carefully and the models carefully. Okay, Howard. So, so I think um, cricket. Your, your point about you know that it's not quite clinical um, is is not actually the case. I mean, there's people ordering this all over the place, and and we don't have any way of putting putting a boundary on that. And so, my concern is that if we don't move faster, um, to Stephen's point, it's going to be filled. Uh, by consumer genomics, and it's happening more and more. I think the leap between Helix doing consumer only 
and somebody plugging an app in to analyze your genome is an app away. And I think one of our challenges we have as a medical community is how do we be responsible, as you're saying, which I completely agree, uh, and get this out there in a way that people are, can use it. And I think as long as we can't solve some of those problems, we're not stopping it. It's, it's just continuing to go. And so I think, you know, we can debate what's the right answer, but the answer is that it's happening and, and speed, to Stephen's point, is critical, and we can't get it all right. There's no such thing as a right answer in all this. Um, so I, I don't know what the right answer is, but I mean, I think the, the horse is out of the barn, and we're trying to figure out how do we add some more context around that um, and to do it in a way that's responsible, but we can't be slow. Okay, and first I'm going to give Callum the last word because we're already five minutes over. So I was just going to say, I mean, this is an obvious information content problem. I mean, there's, you'd need everybody with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that has ever been born on the planet to be able to look at modifiers. We need a system that is completely integrated with our healthcare system to ever be able to do this. And I, I just don't see any way around it. I mean, the, the scale of what we're talking about is so massive that unless we're actually using all the information we have access to, and as Les says, choosing other data sets, Mark said the same, that we need to gain access to, we'll never be able to deconvolute. Well, on that small challenge, um, <laughs> we'll close the discussion, and I apologize, I know there weren't, we weren't able to get to everybody, um, but we are five minutes late, which is my standard, so I'm going to stop, and um, we'll go out and take a picture, and Teji is going to direct us. Uh, yes, yeah, so we just head out this door, the short people should be in the front, so short is defined by me, I'm 5'4", so if you're 5'4", <laughs> be in the front, um, and then we're, we're, lunch is behind us, and we'll be back at 1.30.